Hello, Market Insights Watchers. We're recording today's webinar on Friday, May 3rd. In Market Roundup, April jobs numbers are in. Uh, what's next for the Fed? In Tech Megatrends, the AI data center boom is setting up a segment of the nuclear energy market for a windfall, possibly yes, a learn how to invest. And in Crypto Corner, Ian will share the latest in crypto developments, especially where ETFs are concerned in our pension plans. So let's get to it. Hello, Ian. How are you today? I'm good, Amber. We're recording this on Friday. What are your Cinco de Mayo plans this weekend? <laughs> Oh, Ian, it's, I always have, you usually go to a local restaurant and have, mm -hmm. uh, have a fried ice cream. <laughs> oh, that's fun. It's always fun, right? So. There's a big, there's a, actually, I saw there's a big party downtown, uh, this weekend. It's oh, kind of turned into like an American holiday, by the way, Cinco mm -hmm. de Mayo. It's awesome. Glad it falls on a weekend this year. Yeah, everyone can have a little fun. I love it. Okay, Ian, well, in market roundup, market soared after a weaker than expected April's jobs report boosted confidence that the Fed will possibly be able to start cutting rates this year. Uh, the jobs report showed the U.S. added 175,000 jobs in April, uh, much below estimates for of 240,000. The U.S. April unemployment rate rose to 3.9% uh, from 3.8%. Average hourly earnings climbed 0.2% from March and 3.9% from a year ago. This is the slowest pace since June 2021. Now, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said on May 1st that cuts can be expected once economic data provides clear evidence that, quote, inflation is moving downward. So, of course, Ian, everyone, one month of decelerated jobs and wage growth do not make a trend. So it will be a data by data scenario to determine uh, when the Fed will begin cutting rates. So as of now, uh, bets for a rate cut jumped higher for September and December this year. So Ian, what are your thoughts on this new data that's come out on our jobs? I mean, you know, my first thought is, look, I mean, they were expecting 250,000 jobs. We got 175,000. So like literally that's a 75,000 job difference. And I'm just thinking to myself as a little bit of a conspiracy theorist here, like if we just recruited, you know, 70,000 people to like quit their job next month, like could, could we add another $5 trillion to the market? I mean, it, to me, it just seems kind of crazy that it's so much is riding on this one data point. And the difference is literally the amount of people that could fit in a football stadium. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, the market has jumped I know the Dow at this point is up 450 points. The S&P is up 50 handles. So it's like, you know, you've added about $5 trillion to the uh, the stock market and the bond market in one quick trail swoop. But, you know, overall, I think that this is a step in the right direction. Um, it it We've been saying, like, is it going to be a soft landing? Is it going to be a hard landing? It doesn't feel like there's like going to be a landing at all at this point because the you know, people are still getting jobs. And obviously the average hourly earnings is is the key right here. It's the slowest rate, I believe, in about a year and a half, um, month over month. So that, that's a really good sign that inflation is is cooling. Okay. Well, we have to see how this goes. Um, the, the work screen, we're seeing that potential cuts could be on the table as early as September and maybe by December. But data by databases, we'll see how it goes. Now in tech megatrends. Electric utilities are actually facing the biggest demand jump in a generation. Uh, this spells potential great news for a select segment of the energy market. So more on that in a moment. Uh, actually, this electricity demand is greatly happening thanks to the growing need for data centers that run artificial intelligence computing. So this behemoth electricity demand came to light during Dominion Energy's first quarter earnings call on May 2nd. A Dominion Energy headquartered right in Richmond, Virginia, is one of the United States' largest producers and distributors of energy. Now, the utility company said that data center developers in Northern Virginia are requesting, get this, quote, as much power as several nuclear reactors can generate, end quote. Now, this is a testament to how AI is really pumping electricity demand 
Now, per Bloomberg code, Dominion regularly fills requests from developers who planned data center campuses actually need as much as several gigawatts of electricity. Now, a gigawatt, just so you know, is roughly the output of a nuclear reactor and can power 750,000 homes. End quote. So Robert Blue, chairman and president and CEO of Dominion, stated that the company is going to see substantial load growth uh, driven by electrification and data centers for the foreseeable future. A recent forecast from Constellation summarized it best. Now, they said that per nuclear newswire, AI and data center growth will drive power demand. Major tech companies are expected to invest in $1 trillion in data centers over the next five years. And in the next five years- A trillion. A trillion. It's, it's, wow. it's, I mean, with a T, that consumers mm -hmm. in the next five years and businesses will generate actually twice as much data as all the data created over the past 10 years. An AI data center racks could require seven times more power than traditional data center racks. So what does this mean for us as investors? Well, forecasts are clear. A big technology company see AI a transformational, as transformational for the industry and for their particular industry. So Nuclear Newswire pointed out that these tech companies need clean, dependable power 24-7. And that means uh, nuclear power is a good energy match to meet their needs, but not just any nuclear power. Uh, you see, data center operators are starting to explore alternative power sourcing strategies for on-site, uh, quote, power generation, which includes small modular reactors or SMRs. So, Ian, you may know where I'm going with this. Um, uh, I SMRs, sure do. <laughs> SMRs are compact, easier to build and operate nuclear reactors that can generate electricity just like larger reactors. And just a little caveat, according to Allied Market Research, the global small modular reactor market is actually projected to reach $13.4 billion by 2032 from $5.8 billion in 2022. This is a compound annual growth rate of 8.7%. Now, there's one company in the Strategic Fortunes model portfolio right now that is already taking preemptive steps to capture the future demand for small modular nuclear reactors. So we're mm -hmm. up about 24% uh, as of this recording uh, on this stock uh, since being recommended this past October. Now to get its name and ticker, uh, please make sure you subscribe to Strategic Fortunes to get all those details, including the name and ticker of 21 other hand-selected stocks for this next generation of investing. And of course, you can please click the blue icon right here, the bull icon over my shoulder to get all those details or the email that accompanies, uh, there's a link in the email that accompanies this video so you can learn how to join. But, you know, Ian, data centers, not just any data center, AI data centers seem to be the place to be, especially where nuclear power is concerned. Yeah, and you know what's really interesting is that the, the growth in utilities has been, you know, very marginal for the last mm -hmm. couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you're going to see this decade, especially with all the demand coming from AI and also the electrification of our of our vehicles and, mm -hmm. and everything else, all the other stuff in your house that needs electricity, right. you're going to start to see that delta, that shift start to accelerate. And this has implications, you know, not just for this one company that makes small modular reactors, mm -hmm. but also for, you know, the entire electrical grid as a whole and, mm -hmm. and all of infrastructure. You've seen a lot of infrastructure move, stocks move up over the last year. Um, and I know you and I, Amber, have been looking at some ideas that we can add to the portfolio. But I do think yeah. this is one of these trends that, you know, it's not just a year or two. This is a long term, mm -hmm. you know, decade type trend. One caveat to that, Amber. Mm -hmm. Okay, so of course, we've talked about nuclear fusion, AI energy. Of course, OpenAI has a big uh, investment in nuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. The one caveat to AI data centers not needing as, as much uh, power as we expect is that mm -hmm. if you go back to the 90s, there was basically an arms race to lay fiber optics all around the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we there were companies like um, Alcatel and Lucent, you might remember, Frontier oh. mm -hmm. Networks. And what happened was somebody figured out some research that one optic fiber could hold 100 times more data than previously thought. Mm 
Mm. So all of a sudden there was a glut in that industry. Mm. And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, history repeats itself, but I kind of, part of me worries that we might get to the point where maybe the AI dentists don't need as much energy. You know, maybe we start moving more towards quantum, uh, which is going to require less energy, or maybe they figure out how to make those chips uh, denser uh, mm. and require less power. And so, you know, that's just something that one of the things we do in the research service is make sure we're paying attention to the prevailing science of the time, not just the companies, because if there is a massive change like that, you know, it could impact our portfolio. So I, I, I think that right now, the the uh, expectations and the forecast for the electricity grid to continue moving up are right. But the one caveat I said is that very similar to what happened with fiber optics in the 90s, you might have some scientific breakthrough that just changes the equation for everyone. Mm, that's fascinating and so true, Ian. Yes, history doesn't repeat, does not normally repeat itself, but we have to really be able to pivot. So I love. And would that. you? Well, let me ask you a question too. So if if they say you know these small modular reactors are safe, would would you want one like down the street from you, like in your neighborhood? <laughs> well, you know, I I don't think I think we have well we have a large reactor not too far away. So yeah. I, yeah, I, at this point, Ian, whatever helps to move the AI right. forward, we have to do what we have to do. Because we'll I mean, people worry about NIMBY, right? Not in my yeah. backyard. So, I, I mean, the nuclear power is great, but just go put it somewhere else. Somewhere else. Um, right? I know. But nowadays, there's such population density happening, it's hard to find those remote areas. True. Depends. Well, Ian, tell All us. All right. About with crypto, I'm, I'm all ears on crypto. We were discussing some cool information ahead. Okay, so everyone knows we got the Bitcoin ETFs in January, and then we had the halving in April. Um, and you know, Bitcoin has kind of been in a bit of a purgatory. We had a little bit of pullback, and we've moving sideways. There's one little piece of information, a story that I, I read, was reading about um, that I think is is worth paying attention to, mm -hmm. and. BlackRock, which is a $12 trillion asset manager, uh, not only manages assets for retail investors, but they have relationships with endowment funds, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, basically massive institutional uh, investors around the world. Mm -hmm. And there, there was an interview that I was reading about the head of their digital assets group. His name is Robert Michnick. Um, he was talking about how the firm BlackRock is seeing, quote, a reinitiation of the discussion around Bitcoin with these sovereign wealth funds, pension funds and endowments. And, you know, everyone expected that, OK, you got the ETF. Um, yeah, well, we, we talked about this when, when the ETF was approved. What I said was it's not like these institutions like immediately go and then buy billions of dollars worth of it. it that's just not how institutions work. If you're a pension fund, you usually have a board that you have an advisory board. Same thing with a sovereign wealth fund. And so you have to have basically a quarterly meeting where an analyst or a portfolio manager will bring up an idea and the board will have to vote whether or not they want to start allocating funds towards it. Um, and so, you know, these institutions move a lot slower. But what we're hearing now, basically from BlackRock, is that we are on the cusp of these institutions starting to move some of their assets into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if you look at like $100 trillion, let's say, worth of global wealth that's managed in these funds, just 1% of that is a trillion dollars, right? I mean, that, that that's equivalent to buying the entire supply, uh, uh, the entire market of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, too, about these institutions is that when they buy, they aren't going to be selling if it goes up 20% or 30%. These are funds that basically have specific strategies, allocation strategies, and they might be you know 3% gold, let's say 2% oil. Uh, and if they put just a little bit in Bitcoin, uh, that's coming, that supply is coming off the market. It's not, it's, it's not going to be out there to trade. And when you have the supply coming off, as well as the new miners issuance has been going down uh, with the halving, obviously it was cut in half. Mm -hmm. uh, you can argue that we are going to see higher prices at, at some point this year uh, from where they are now. So I thought that was um, a really interesting uh, 
interview that they had with uh, Robert Michnik. And it also just coincides with what I've been saying. Even though you have an ETF, doesn't mean institutions are immediately going in. It's going to take some time, but it's still heading in this direction where institutions are making it part of their portfolio as a non-correlated asset class. So I thought that was the biggest news this week um, in the crypto space. Mm, that is big news indeed, Ian. Wow, I love that. Okay, so everyone, that's it for this week. If you do have a question for us to address, uh, please email us at marketinsights at bannonhill.com. All right, thanks, Amber. Have a good weekend. And uh, of course, may the 4th be with you. Take care. <laughs> Same to you, Ian. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. <laughs>